Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Amen. Take your Bible and let's look at an Old Testament passage in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I want to talk to you this morning around the subject of removing the barriers to worship. Removing the barriers to worship. Uh, every year for the last 10, 11 years, we've set aside <clears throat> this particular Sunday, uh, the third Sunday of the new year, to focus in on Christ-centered worship. Now, let me, let me ask you to do a little favor for me here this morning, okay? And, and really, it's more for you than it is to me. Uh, but when you hear <clears throat> the word worship, What's the first word that comes to your mind? You ought to write it down. You ought to really be able to remember. You ought to be able to identify, to pinpoint uh, what it is that you have in the conception of your mind, what worship actually is. Um, The majority of the people that you talk to will identify worship primarily as what we've just done it would be in the area of music. You ask somebody, well, it'd be praise, be singing, uh, be music. But today, what I, what I really, what I really, really, really want to happen today, I, I, want to, I want to see our concept of worship expanded much bigger than that. So, some people have the, 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 the misconception that worship is relegated to a slice of time cut out of their week that they join together in some kind of corporate setting like this on a Sunday morning, and uh, we, 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 we're going to go to worship. Now, here's the deal. Uh, if uh, worship is limited to singing, that, there's lots of people in this building that are in big trouble. I, I, I've stood beside some of you. As a matter of fact, your neighbor today would probably say to you, would you just clap... Uh, because that's so it, it's a whole lot more uh, than just singing and I'm glad uh, it's not limited to an hour uh, of the week uh, you, we, we, we have, I've made a mistake I've, I've been asking the wrong question I really have for a while and I didn't identify it until I was working uh, in the last couple of weeks and getting ready for today and, and, and just in the last day or two I realized I've been asking the wrong kinds of questions. When I meet new people, when I'm, I'm confronting somebody uh, out in the community, I'll ask the question, when you worship, where do you go? Now listen to how that communicated. That, that's been a question I've been asking for years. When you worship, where do you go? So the, what I've just done is I have isolated worship to a particular time and a particular place, a particular event that goes on during the week. And that's wrong. And I I want us to see that it's a a, a much bigger than that. Here's what happens when when it boils down to that. It becomes, if you're not careful, it becomes a consumer mentality. You wind up in consumerism. So the question would be, uh, after the 9.30 service, somebody meets you out in the hallway, how was worship today? Well, it was good. It was all right. I got a lot out of it. Or, it just wasn't hitting on much today. Music was kind of dull. Preaching was irrelevant. And, and so you, you, you got this thing that worship then becomes an event, much like going to the movies. We went to see Star Wars and, and uh, last night or yesterday afternoon. And, and somebody asked me right out, did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. So you, do you like worship? Yeah, I like to worship. Wrong questions. Wrong identification. Here, here's the question that we ought to be asking. We ought to be asking, how was my worship? Okay, you see the difference? How was... My worship, not how was the worship, but how was my worship. Regardless of what happens in the parking lot, 
when you drive onto the property, regardless of whether the driver was a very good one on the shuttle bus or not, regardless of whether anybody spoke to you uh, on Main Street, regardless of whether an usher helped you to get to your seat or not, regardless of what the music sounded like, regardless of what the preaching was like, you, you understand that it's not what happens on the stage. It's what happens in your heart. And there's a huge difference. Can I get an amen from somebody out of the, the building here this morning? So w this morning, we're going to be talking about Abraham. Now, we got a lot of new people in here. Probably the first time, maybe somebody even been to church uh, and, and don't know anything about church, don't know anything about the Bible. When I talk about, when we're going to talk about Abraham, I'm not talking about the guy who freed the slaves during the Civil War, okay? Let's just get that out here. We're, we're not talking about that uh, this morning. So... Uh, but there's some of you that have been coming here a very long time, and I love preaching, and I love preaching to new people that are here for your first time, and I love preaching to people that have been here, and there's some been here for a very, very, very long time. Matter of fact, they went to shepherding school with Abraham. <laughs> uh, they've been here a long time. So with that in mind, I want you to stand with me. Genesis 22, and let's pick it up in verse 1. I'm going to read a long passage. Don't normally do that. But I want you to see everything going on. I want you to hear it. And I want you to really digest it for a few minutes. It came to pass after these things that God put Abraham to a test. And he said, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. Oh, wow. That, that, that's said over and over in, in, in the text. He said, take your son Isaac, whom you love, get to a land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw the place far off. Abraham said to his young men, abide here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come back. Abraham took, uh, what, what's he going to do? We're going to go, what? Worship. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they both of them went together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Hey, Dad, look here, Dad. I, I'm your son. Here, here's the fire. Here's the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him in a, ram, a, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I'll bless you and in multiplying I'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because you obeyed me. Powerful words. Father, uh, we gather together here in your name. We don't have to ask you to come. You promised that you'd be here. We welcome your presence among us. I pray that you would get glory in the remaining portion of this service so that at the end of the day, Lord, we'll be able to thank you and praise you for all that you did. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Now, when I read this as a young believer, just a new Christian, now I'm going to tell you, I was bothered by it. Uh, I, I was disturbed by it. It was a story that just kind of turned my world upside down. When I think about uh, how that 
Abraham waited until he was about 100 years old. Sarah was 90. All of their friends were buying depends, and here they were out buying diapers. And, and, it, and they, they got this boy that God had uh, promised to them. It was an amazing thing. And, and then something happened that just was straight out of the, in or, just or, not ordinary. It was different. Isaac maybe is a teenage boy, about 14, 15 years old by this time. And God says, okay, I want you to take Isaac. I want you to go to the mountain and I'm going to show you. And there I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice uh, unto me. Now, typically, uh, you'd take grain or an animal and you'd put that on the sacrifice and you would offer that unto God. But Abraham was a rich guy. He had lots of stuff. He had lots of money. He had lots of cattle. He had, a, he had an abundance of this world's goods. So he comes along and says to Abraham, I, want, I don't want you to take a, 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 a lamb. I don't want you to take any grain. I want you to take your son. Can you imagine the thoughts that Abraham might have been having between verses 2 and 3? Now wait a minute here. Now, God, seriously, I did that circumcision thing, and that was a drag, God. I just want you to know. And, and now you're asking me to take my boy that I love so deeply and, and to do this? this. This just doesn't make sense. But in spite of that, look at verse 5. In spite of that, Abraham said to these guys that were with him, stay here with the ass Isaac and I are going to go on top of the mountain up here and we're going to worship. He saw his sacrifice of his son as a part of worship. Now, here's the deal. I don't want to just approach this as some kind of biblical history. I want to get this as personal with us this morning as I possibly can. So let me just ask you the question. Where do you get the faith to worship when things get tough? When things get difficult? And by the way, I'll just tell you this, worship can be and is difficult. If it were easy, the building would be packed in standing room only three times today. It is a difficult process. It is a difficult thing. Uh, one of the things I, I, I had a ball doing this week and Kathy and I had a long discussion about it. Uh, I've had a ball inviting people to come to church this week. I, I don't know what was so special about this week. It, it was very busy. It was upside down. It was packed to the gills. But everywhere I went, God put people in my life that I, I could invite uh, to come to church. And, and, and some of them would tell me, you know, well, yeah, Pastor, I am a Christian. I said, well, where do you go to church? And, and, and they would say, well, <laughs> We're not in church right now. now I don't get that. I, I just don't get it. If God saved you and forgiven you and, and, and wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life and he's going to carry you to his heaven one of these days, why in the world wouldn't you want to be in church? I, I don't get that. And then there are other people that give me all kinds of excuses. Boy, you hear them all, I, I can tell you. Um, they, they, well, you know, I'm just so busy. I, I really do this on Sunday, and I got this going on on Sunday, and I, I, I just got all this packed up. Well, that's pregame day. Is at 11 o'clock, man. I got to be there at the pregame show. I don't want to miss the pregame. Your church is just so big, preacher. But, but whatever the answer is that they give you, it's just difficult. It's hard. Now, two questions come out of that that I want to ask you. Currently, currently, what do you sacrifice to worship God? Second question. Is there anything in your life right now that you love more than God? You have anything in a higher position, a higher priority in your life 
than God. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you just got something going on with some dude. Maybe you got something going on with some gal. You just got a relationship that's just more important to you than anything in the world right now. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a dream. But is there anything right now that you can just put your finger on and say, you know what? I really think more of that than I do God. Now the Bible teaches us that we were created to worship God, that he is worthy of our, we've been singing about it all morning long, he is worthy of our best. Now, if worship is more than singing, if worship is more than just a slice of time uh, out of your week on a particular day at a particular place, uh, how in the world do we ever get to the point in our life that life becomes worship to us? Our life becomes worship. Well, I got three things that I'm going to share with you, some a little quicker than others, and uh, things that Abraham did, all right? And I think you'll resonate with, with this first one especially. Uh, one of the obstacles that we have in our life if, 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 that we got to get rid of, that if we're going to live a life of worship, it, is that we've got to calm the noise. Verse 1, Abraham, I'm here. I'm here. He was in a place in his life that he could hear from God. Do you, do you know you can't listen to God if you've got a lot of noise going on around you? But it is amazing, absolutely phenomenal when you can just silence the stuff around you how much God then is able to speak into your life. You understand that worship is not about making noise. It's not about singing so much. It's about what takes place in a person's life. It's about listening to what God has to say to you and then responding to God when he is leading your life. That's worship. <clears throat> Finish the phrase. Be still and know that I'm God. Get the noise out of your life so that you can hear from me, I want to ask you a question. When is the last time that you got rid of the noise completely out of your life so that you could just hear him? In the last 24 hours, has there been any time in the last day that you just sat, got the noise out of your life, and listened? Now, typically, what, ha what happens when it starts our day is something like this. The alarm clock goes off. Ah! That's how our day gets started. We're just all bent out of shape. What's the next thing we do? We turn the news on. I want to get the weather. I want to find out the traffic report. I, I don't want to get caught up in traffic going to work. Then we get in our car. What's the first thing we do? We turn the radio on. Boom, more noise. And then all day long, there's noise going on around us. We get back home, back into the noise. We got kids, we got spouses. We turn the television on, more noise. And finally, we say, I just got to get away for a minute. I got to get out of this noise for a minute. I'm going to go take a walk or I'm going to go take a jog. What do you do? You put that stuff in your ears. So that noise. And, and then there's a lot of you, even when you go to bed, you got one of those noise machines right beside your bed that you want to hear nature sounds while you try to go to sleep. Noise. Now I'm not, I'm not down on Christian music. I'm just down on noise. Megan Trainer, she got a song out called All About That Bass. I, I'm all about the noise. I'm gonna create a, I'm gonna create my own album. I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna call it all about silence. When's the last time you had any silence in your life? I, I spoke to a group of women not long ago, and uh, I finished uh, my message, and they they wanted to do Q and A, and so I was there 15, 20 minutes just doing Q and A, and and right before we left, this, this young lady just broke down and she started weeping and crying, and, and she says. How do you do that? 
I wake up in the morning, first thing I've got to do, I've got to take care of kids. Got to get them off to school. Got to get ready to go to work. I go to work and then I go to pick up the kids and then I come home from work and I got to fix their supper and I got to give them a bath. I got to get them to bed. And by then I'm just totally a wreck and I'm exhausted. Wind, noise. We just don't have time to be still and to know God. But this is a stretch for some of you. God wants you to know him. And, and he wants to lead you and he wants to guide you and he wants to direct your life. He wants you to understand what this abundant life in Christ is all about. And he says to us out of his word, if I put my spirit in you, do you know that I have a reason for doing that? If I take up residence to live my life in you, don't you understand that I want to communicate with you because of that? I want to talk to you. I got stuff to say. I, I, I got to give you direction uh, in your life. I, I tell you, I, I, just in the last little bit, in the last two or three days, I, I just had a time that I, I wanted to silence myself in the Word. I don't, I don't mind telling you. I got into Psalm 90. And I just read. <laughs> And I got to just listening to what God had to say to me out of his word. And, and when I got still before him and he started pouring himself into me and, and showing me stuff and affirming some things that I had questions about. God, is this really you? And he affirmed that in my heart. I couldn't do anything but just lift my hands in the silence of that moment. I don't know how long, but in the silence of that time and just lifted my hands and glorified and praised him. In the silence of that moment. Verse 1, I'm here. I'm listening. You've got my attention so that that small, still voice of God could speak into his life in the time of worship. Now, here's the deal. When you get still, you get the noise out of your life, and God speaks... Then there's the prompting behind it. All right, now I got to determine what I'm going to do about what I just heard. Y'all tracking with me? I got still before him. He talked to me. He told me stuff. Now what am I going to do about it? Brings me to the second. You ready? Not only calm down, but commit yourself to obedience. This is the entire story of Abraham and Isaac. Boils down to one word, obedience. Now, the first thing that he had to do, watch this, oh, this is powerful. The first thing that he had to do is that he had to resist the natural. He had to refuse the natural reaction. What am I going to do about this? You want me to take Isaac and put him on some wood and you want me to offer him up? But he resisted and refused to go the natural. You say, how do you know that? Well, look at verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place of far off. Three days now, he's been walking from his house, going to the place and can you just imagine what he was contemplating? Can you imagine what was going through his mind? Can you imagine the thought processes as he's walking for three days? He's got wood on his back and he's going, he's looking for a place that he knows he's going to offer his son up. I can't do this. How am I going to do this? Tormenting him. How in the world am I ever going to explain this to his mama? What's well, beyond my imagination if God would ask me to do that? I, I mean, I, I, my dad didn't have much to do with me at all when I was growing up, just being honest with you. Uh, just nothing much. So, so <laughs> when Kathy got pregnant and, and uh, I found out I was going to have a boy, wow, wow. I fully determined I'm going to be a good daddy to that boy. I'm going to love that boy. I'm going to spend time with that boy. 
and pour my life into that boy. He's not going to miss out on anything. I'm, I'm going to provide the best life I know for him. I can only imagine what would have happened if God came to me and said, I want you to offer him up. Now, I will to tell you, when he was a teenager, I would have gladly done it. Just, just say it. Can, can I get a witness from any of the parents that are in here, you, you, you know? The natural thing for Abraham would have been to bargain with God. The, the, the natural thing for him to have been would be to counter offer something to God. Well, well God, that I understand, but would you do this instead? By the way, that was his track record. And if you ever study Genesis and you study Abraham's life, you'll discover that that's exactly how, what he was accustomed to. And, and so you would have thought that that would have been his process. But Abraham worshiped through obedience, following God's plan as God revealed it to him. So here's, here's the deal that I'm gonna challenge you with this week. When, when you're going through your exercises of this coming week, you have to understand that when God gives you direction and leadership and guidance and the word of God speaks to you, circumstances arise, when you resist the natural tendencies and you obey and do what God tells you to do, that is worship. That's worship. You show that God is the priority in your life. Clearly, Abraham loved Isaac. It's clear that Abraham loved God more. And that's the essence of worship. That God is the priority. And that you love him more than anything else. It doesn't mean that you can't love other things. God designed you to love other things. God designed other things for you to love but he's got to be the priority. You gotta love him more than anything else. I, I tell everywhere, everywhere I go, First Baptist Church Indian Trail loves God. They, they wanna know God. They want God's blessings. You have to get to the point though that you realize that obedience and blessings go together. I saw something on social media yesterday that absolutely just made me sick to my stomach. And I thought, no wonder we're not seeing revival in America. When there was a ministry that was advertising a couple's retreat and they said, y'all come, it's gonna be an amazing time. We're gonna grow in the Lord. We're gonna be blessed by God. And all you couples come. Now you don't have to be married. If you're just in a relationship, y'all come and we're gonna all be blessed by God. Wrong. God doesn't bless disobedience. Some of you in business, you say, I want God to bless my business. And yet at the end of the month, you do some fuzzy math with the books. And you're thinking, why isn't God blessing my business? Because God's not going to bless disobedience. Abraham obeyed and God blessed him. Look at verse 16. By myself I sworn for because you've obeyed me, because you've done this thing and, and you've not withheld, you didn't disobey. That in blessing I'll bless and multiply. I will multiply. I want that. I don't know about you, but I want God's blessings on my life. I'm not necessarily talking about finances. I'm not necessarily talking about stuff. I just want God to bless me any way that he chooses to bless me. Do you want God's blessings? Blessings and obedience go together. All right, let me give you number three. You ready? Pretty simple. Celebrate God's goodness. Celebrate God's goodness. Now, at this point, you gotta, you gotta use your imagination just a little bit because the word doesn't say it. But you gotta use your imagination just a little bit. Abraham takes that teenage boy and he lays him down on the wood. You got it? Shake your head like that, I got it. 
He gets a knife. Now he's bound up. He gets a knife and he's about to thrust that knife into the chest of his son that he loves so deeply that he waited a hundred years for. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. God knew that he loved him. And he's about to put that knife in his chest and all of a sudden, out of heaven, God says, stop it. So now, Abraham, you can see that you love me even more than the son that I gave you. And I know that you love me more than the son that you gave me. Look behind you, Abraham. Abraham turns and he looks. And there's a ram caught in the horn, with his horns in the thickets. <laughs> can you imagine? Takes that knife, instead of thrusting it in the chest of his son, he cuts the ropes loose and lets him go, gets the ram and sacrifices that ram what kind of reaction did Abraham have? I promise you this, it wasn't blasé. He didn't say to Isaac, well, son, let's just go back to the house. It's been a colossal waste of time up here. My feet are hurting, my back's killing me from having to carry all that wood. Let's just go on back home. No. I believe there was a spring in his step. I believe there was a song on his lips. I believe there was rejoicing in his heart all the way back home for what God had done. I know this. I know this. I've seen it. You want to be closer to God than you are. You want God's blessings. I, I believe this with all of my heart. This people here today want to be salt and light. They want to be sensed that there is a presence of God. They want it visible, the countenance on their face, that when people see you, you want them to see God in you. I'm convinced of that with all of my life. But, but what, what is it then that keeps you from living a life of sacrifice in order for God to be number one in your life? What is it? What Isaac do you have in your life? What do you love more dearly than you do anything else? Write it down. What's stopping you from living this life daily of sacrifice? Is it busyness? Is it laziness? Are you, are you afraid that you're going to fail? Is there some kind of sex-related issue in your life that stops you from being who God wants you to be? Is there some drug-related issue that you're dealing with that you can't handle, that, that that very thing is stopping you from being blessed by God? It's just a lot of stuff that gets in the way. You say, Mike, I, I don't know that I can give that up. I just don't know. Would you agree with me that Isaac was a good thing in Abraham's life? Would you agree with me about that? Would Isaac, would, it, would he have been a good thing in Abraham's life if Abraham loved Isaac more than he did God and it was the love that he had for Isaac that kept him from being obedient unto God, then that good thing ultimately would have been turned into a bad thing you understand there's, 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 there's probably a lot of good stuff going on in your life a lot of good things a lot of good people a lot of good stuff but if a good person or a good thing or good stuff is hindering God from being the priority in your life, then that good thing has become a bad thing. Write it down, figure it out. What, what is it that's hindering me from the blessings of God and living a life of worship? So the bottom line question today is this. Ready for this? Mike, and this is worth the price that you pay to get in here today. All right? Mike, uh, how was it 
that Abraham could take his son that he waited a hundred years for and offer him up to God as a sacrifice. How could he do such a thing as that? Want to know the answer? Here's how he did it. His focus was not on Isaac. His focus was on God. You say, I can't do this. I can't lay it down. I can't give it up. Well, the problem is your focus is in the wrong place. The focus is on what you think you can't live without or can't do without when your focus really ought to be on God. You know what that is? When you can do that, that when you can focus in on God rather than on stuff, that is worship. You say, I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. You're right. You don't. But the day that you turned from sin, trusted Jesus, Holy Spirit came into you. It's him in you that enables you to get rid of the stuff that hinders you from being who God wants you to be and the blessings that God wants to give you. A couple of thousand years later, there was another man who put wood on his back. He climbed up another mountain. But this time there was no angel that cried out of heaven when they got ready to thrust the nails in his hands and in his feet and the spear in his side and the thorns on his head. There was no angel that cried out of heaven, stop! That day there was no ram caught in the thickets to take his place. He gave his life so that you could live. Some of you today have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Today you need to turn away from sin. Jesus needs to become the number one priority in your life. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a minute. If you've never been saved, if you've never trusted Jesus, if you don't have the assurance when you die you're going to go to heaven, if you You've never had a a time or a place where God gloriously changed your life. It can be right here and it can be right now. And I want you to pray something like this with me. You've got to really mean it. You've got to really trust in Jesus. This prayer can't save you. You can't go to heaven on my prayer. You've got to make it the sincere desire of your heart. So pray something like this with me. Heavenly Father, you can pray it out louder in the confines of your own heart. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. And I know that I'm a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.